So what is learning and what is memory? Whenever we try to acquire knowledge, that is learning. So whenever I read a book and try to acquire knowledge from it, then it is called as learning. Learning is nothing but the acquisition of knowledge. What is memory? So whatever knowledge we have acquired, we are able to encode it, store it and retrieve it whenever we need it. For example, you are encoding and storing it in the brain and in your example, you are going to retrieve it. So this encoding and everything is called as the memory. Memory can be classified into two ways. One is based on their duration. Duration, it's very simple. The memory is classified into short term, intermediate and long term. What is short term memory? Short term memory, you remember something it for a seconds to minutes. Intermediate is minutes to hours to days. You remember it for a longer duration. Then long term is days to weeks to years. You remember it for a very, very long time. In the short term itself, we have one thing called as working memory. When I discuss the limbic system itself, I told you the prefrontal cortex is involved in working memory. So the prefrontal cortex is involved in working memory. What is the best example? The entering an OTP in the mobile. The, whenever you plug in the details of your card, then OTP will come to you. Then you will remember that OTP for a very short span of time. This is done with the help of prefrontal cortex. And once you write the OTP, you will forget the number. And another example is whenever in your childhood, your mom has asked to purchase you three things, you'll keep on repeating those things till you reach the shop and tell them. Once you tell them, then you forget it. So these are the examples for working memory. And most important part is this conversion of short term to long term. And I told you this can happen in sleep only. And this process is called as consolidation. This process is called consolidation. And the part involved in this conversion is hippocampus. Hippocampus is the most important part involved in this conversion of short term to long term memory. And coming to the forms of memory. Now we have discussed the memory classification based on the duration of memory. Now there are two different classifications based on the forms of memory. One is called as explicit memory. Explicit memory. It is called as declarative memory. And there is another thing called as implicit memory. Implicit memory. So what is the basic difference between these two is in the first explicit memory, we need consciousness. You need to be aware and take the decisions. Your brain needs to be active to take the decisions. Whereas in implicit memory, it does not need awareness. Don't think there is complete loss of consciousness. That is different. It is done at a subconscious level, we can say. It needs very little awareness. I will tell you the example, then you will understand it. Then explicit memory, it is further divided into episodic memory episodic memory and second one is semantic memory what is this episodic memory episodic memory suppose you attend your friend's birthday or your friend's wedding and i ask you what all the events happened in that day you will be able to answer we will tell that morning we dressed up nicely then went to hall and the food was good and everything but you need your memory to recall it and tell it so this kinds of memory which is involved in remembering the episodes or the events it is called episodic memory. And the brain area involved in this is the hippocampus and neocortex. This implicit memory does not require usually the hippocampal uh, help. Whereas the facts, that is, you remember a fact, you study some Bohr effect, Haldane effect, and you remember the fact. When I ask you, you have to think once and then repeat the answer. You will not, you cannot say it without thinking. So this kinds of memory which is happening for the facts is called a semantic memory, which also needs awareness and it is happening in the prefrontal cortex. The working memory was also happening in the prefrontal cortex. So these are the explicit memory. Then when coming to the implicit memory, there are several divisions for the implicit memory and all of them are important. Now explicit memory, episodic memory and semantic memory. Coming to implicit memory, there are four further classifications. And I have told you one already, which is called priming. I give you some information. Based on that information, you give me some answers. So let's study for one by one. The first one is procedural. So you learn driving the car initially. So the best example is driving a car. For the initial few days, you will be very much upright. But once you learn it very properly, sometimes you will remember starting it from the home and reaching the point. You don't remember anything in between, but you would have braked properly. Then you would have reached every places properly wherever you want to do. This is a kind of procedural memory. You do the procedure and you become an expert out of it. So this is a kind of procedural memory like driving a car. Initially, it will be an explicit memory. I am not saying it has never been an explicit memory. But once you learn it, it becomes an implicit memory. You need very less awareness 
to conduct it. Then this is involving the striatum, cerebellum and motor cortex. Why motor cortex? Motor has to, has to learn the procedure, then cerebellum has to correct it and striatum is also involved. That's why the lesions of these areas will be involved in the motor system. They will cause motor disorders. Then coming to the next memory which is called as priming. I will give you some beautiful examples then you can understand very easily. So this is done with the help of neocortex. Now try filling the blanks. The first thing I give you an example of apple, orange and I give you what is it? Most of you would have responded. What is the answer? Most of you would have responded for it. Then I give you another example. Black, blue, then what is the answer? In the above case, most of you would have said that it is grapes because I have primed you with the knowledge that apple, orange followed by grapes. GR, you tell it grapes. In the below, even though I give you the same gap, but I did a priming of black, blue. We are talking about color. So you would have said it as green. So this is what priming is all about. The Hans Berger example that I gave it in a sleep study, which is as in AIMS MCQ also, that is also based on the priming. When prior information is giving, you act accordingly. There is one beautiful scene in the movie Inception. Some of you might have watched it. He will say, when I ask you not to think of an elephant, the first thing that comes to your brain is an elephant. Suppose if I tell you don't think of an elephant and I keep on telling the term elephant, all of us tend to remember the image of an elephant, which we cannot avoid because priming has been done here. And this is happening at a subconscious level. That's why some of the decisions we make are happening at a subconscious level because we are primed with ads also. Nowadays, all the ads which is coming in social media apps, without knowing us, we are purchasing some of the products. That is because the priming that is done by them. Now coming to the third one, it is called as associative learning. What is this associative learning? This associative learning means you associate one thing with the other thing. For example, you associate the good food with the memories that is cooked by your mother, something like that. The classical example for this is there is an emotional component involved in this and a skeletal component involved. Like the emotional component is handled by the amygdala, skeletal component by the cerebellum. Here the classical example is our Pavlo's experiment. Pavlo experiment. What they were doing in Pavlo experiment? They were giving a ring and they will give the food and the dog will salivate first. They will keep on doing this procedure. Ring, food and the dog will salivate and they will dog will eat. And finally they remove the food and whenever the bell is ring, the dog was able to associate this ringing sound to the food being issued and it started to salivate even before the food is offered. So this kind of learning is called associative learning and it happens subconsciously. And the final one, last one is called as non-associative learning. Here we are not associating with anything but we are learning. So what is this non-associative learning? It is based on the reflex pathways. And there is two classification in it. One is called as habituation. Second one is called sensitization. What is habituation? Habituation, don't think that the person is hab getting habituated to a particular uh, habit. Habituation means if you are constantly given a stimulus, what we will do? We will try to pay less attention to it. Then we will get habituated to it. For example, the people who live on the rail road, the people living on rail road, they will be able to sleep peacefully at night. But whenever you go to your friend's home and if it is in the rail track, will you be able to sleep? No, we will not be able to sleep. Because your friend might be habituated to the environment and he can ignore the stimulus. What is sensitization? Habituation means ignoring the impulses like for if it is given on a regular basis. What is sensitization? Sensitization is if any stimulus is given and especially a noxious stimulus, the person will have a heightened awareness. Here he is lacking the awareness. Here there will be a heightened awareness. The classical example is if somebody, somebody is bitten by a dog, then every time they see a dog, they will have an increased response and they will stay themselves away from the dog. So this kind of behavior is called as sensitization. So the example by, for sensitization is a person bitten by a dog. So whenever they will, now they will have increased a heightened response to all the dogs even if they want to pet it, they will be very, very carefully doing it because they are, they are sensitized to this noxious stimulus. And the other example is cry of the baby. Cry of the baby usually disturbs, but the mother can respond to it because her sensitivity or sensitization is high. She is constantly awaiting the impulse from the baby. So this is the cry of the baby. These are the classical examples. Now coming to the neuronal basis. So all those examples we have to remember because any of it can be asked in the exams. So coming to the neuronal basis of memory, 
how memory is getting enhanced how brain is getting enhanced this memory that is called as plasticity of the brain how it is happening if you learn constantly a subject you will be an expert out of it if you are learning a surgery constantly then you will become an expert out of it how the brain is become making as an experts of these things that is done with the help of various neurotransmitters and receptors which are getting changed based on our training so first thing is here we can see a presynaptic terminal this is a presynaptic terminal and this is a postsynaptic terminal inside the brain especially the memory forming regions of the brain postsynaptic terminal in the brain in the presynaptic terminal we have one important neurotransmitter that is called as glutamate so this happens normally also not only for the enhanced memory so what this glutamate does is suppose i am giving a stimulus i am reading a book for the first time so what will happen this glutamate has to go and act in the postsynaptic terminal and it will act on two receptors the most important receptors among these two is there is a receptor called as nmda this is the most important receptor but for this receptor to get activated we need help of his friend which is called as ampa AMP, ampa and nmda receptors so the glutamate initially will go and act on the ampa receptors even though nmda is important but it will go and act on the ampa receptors and it will cause the influx of sodium ions now sodium enters and why nmda is not able to be acted directly because nmda as you can see in this diagram it is blocked by this red tag that is nothing but the magnesium this magnesium is keeping the nmda close somebody has to come and kick it off so this sodium whenever it reaches it will go on kick off this magnesium once magnesium is kicked off then this is a more efficient channel nmda is a more efficient channel whenever it is open so whenever this channel is open what will happen is it will cause an influx of sodium calcium most of the positive ion channels so this course calcium what it will do is it will go and form the calcium calmodulin complex and they will further activate the neurotransmitter inside the cell and finally the action will be done if this circuit is continuously activated what will happen is there there are so many things that can happen there will be an increased number of receptors so the number of receptors can increase so whenever a small trigger of that event also can get you an mcq if you are doing mcqs continuously or watching videos continuously you become adapted to it and suddenly a small trigger also will induce this pathway and get you the answer properly so the increased number of receptors that's why the brain it has to be done and repeated multiple times there is a saying also for this use it or lose it especially the brain works on this principle if you use it it will be stay stay there for a very longer time that is one of the advices we advise like puzzle games to be done even for a longer time even for in the old ages so once you keep on activating the brain it is going to stay healthier then next thing is it will increase the neurotransmitters also first thing is it is increasing the increasing the number of receptors then neurotransmitter is increased then third thing is it will increase the enzymatic levels enzymatic levels and it also produces one more neurotransmitter which is a nitric oxide this nitric oxide it acts like a retrograde messenger suppose if this nitric oxide is constantly produced it will it is very good so it will tell the presynaptic terminal this we have to strengthen this particular connection so it acts like a retrograde messenger it keeps on messaging and it improves the connection this sodium nitric oxide is a retrograde messenger so we have to remember all this uh, uh, circuits and ampa and nmda nmda is blocked by the magnesium channels so all this we have to remember and before completing memory there is one common disorder that is a memory related disorder dementia is there that disease is called alzheimer's disease it is one of the most common age related neurodegenerative disorder and what happens here first there will be an episodic memory loss followed by the cognitive functions so initially the people will start as and when they age initially the people will start showing some kind of memory loss episodic memory will be lost they will not be able to recall their past but on a later day their cognition will be lost cognition lost if they will not be able to do the regular day to day activities itself so it is a very very bad for the person and what is the risk factor for this the most important risk factor is there is a gene called as presenilin 1 that is ps is for presenilin this presenilin 1 and 2 they are the risk factors and down syndrome patients with downs they have an early onset of alzheimer's disease and what is the cytopathological hallmark two things are there one is the deposition of 
amyloid blocks. This amyloid blocks can be removed from the CNS only during sleep, maximally during sleep with the help of CSF. So if the person is not sleeping properly, what will happen? There will be severe accumulation of amyloid blocks. Next thing, what, what is going to happen is, the other thing is there is accumulation of tau proteins. This tau proteins is again further is going to inhibit the neurotransmission that is happening in the brain. So these are the two major uh, cytopathological hallmarks. And what is the treatment is acetylcholine esterase inhibitors are given. The common ones are galantamine and rivastigmine. So this is the basis about Alzheimer's disease.